Thanks, Callum. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rosa Murray, and I'm a member of the Scottish Laity Network. Tonight, it's my privilege to welcome you to the final evening of our Lenten journey with our overall theme, the common good. Whilst the concept of the common good has a long history in the Catholic Church, it's something that always needs to be viewed in the context of the signs of the times. In that way, it remains true to its intentions to be a resource that helps us to become more authentic disciples of Jesus in the world today. Throughout our Lenten journey, we have also sought to align ourselves with the central theme of Pope Francis's Lenten message, Lenten penance and the synodal journey. In this message, Pope Francis, reflecting on our current personal and ecclesial reality, invites us to experience the gospel of the transfiguration. For Pope Francis, the transfiguration can be viewed as Jesus' response to the failure of his disciples to understand him. Our Lenten journey is an opportunity to reflect on how well we not only understand Jesus, but how can we truly follow him in word and deed? It is a unique and special time. During this liturgical season, the Lord takes us with him to a place apart. While our ordinary commitments compel us to remain in our usual places and our often repetitive and sometimes boring routines, during Lent, we are invited to ascend a high mountain in the company of Jesus and to live a particular experience of spiritual discipline as God's holy people. So that this transfiguration may become a reality in us this year, Pope Francis proposes two paths to follow in order to ascend that mountain together with Jesus and with him to attain the goal. The first path, listen to him. Lent is a time of grace to the extent that we listen to him as he speaks to us through scripture. In addition to the scriptures, the Lord speaks to us through our brothers and sisters, especially in the faces and the stories of those who are in need. The second path, rise and do not be afraid. Do not take refuge in a religiosity made up of extraordinary events and dramatic experiences, out of fear of facing reality and its daily struggles, its hardships and contradictions. Pope Francis has also clearly identified one general and basic requirement of our synodal journey, the need to be open to and empowered by the Spirit. Speak honestly. Let no one say, I cannot say this, they will think this or this of me. It is necessary to say with parasia all that one feels. It is necessary to say all one feels the need to say, without polite deference, without hesitation. And at the same time, one must listen with humility and welcome with an open heart. Synodality is exercised with these two approaches. For this reason, I ask of you, please to employ these approaches as brothers and sisters in the Lord, speaking with parousia and listening with humility. As is our tradition, let us now spend a few minutes in prayer situating ourselves in the gift of our world and our stewardship of it.
So it's my pleasure now to hand over to Mary Cullen, who is the editor of the Open House and a friend to the Scottish Slater Network. And Open House are co-badging our session tonight. Mary will say a few words about Open House and will then welcome and introduce our companion for this evening. Thanks, Mary. Thanks very much, Rosa. Um, Open House, as many of you know, is an independent Scottish Catholic journal of comment and reflection. It's really a space um, to explore faith in today's Scotland. It was founded by a group of lay Catholics in Dundee in 1990 to help keep alive the spirit of Vatican II. And today it reflects the ecumenical, interfaith and secular reality of Scotland's faith journey. It's monthly, you'll find it online at openhousescotland.org, oh sorry, openhousescotland.co.uk and there is a new edition out next week if you're interested. So thanks for giving me the chance to say that. But it's now my very great pleasure to welcome and introduce our companion for this evening, Tom O'Glaughlin. He's a professor of historical theology at the University of Nottingham. And his research focuses on how Christians imagine themselves in the way they gather and celebrate together what they do and don't do when they celebrate the Eucharist can be a better indicator of what is important to them than their formal statements of belief. Tom is going to speak to us for the next half hour or so on the topic of this evening, which promises to be very interesting. He's going to speak about liturgy and the common good. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mary. And it's very nice to be with you. Uh, I spoke to you before, uh, I think last year, and it's, it's always nice to share ideas with a group of people who are giving up time they could be sitting in front of the television or the fire, or even better, they could be down at the, down the pub. Uh, Liturgy does not usually sit in the same frame as discussions of the common good. Liturgy appears to be something that is really the concern of the experts. It's the concern of the clergy and the choir and a few other odd, odd people that are the, that it's the, that find the dealings of the church and the practices of the church intrinsically fascinating. There was, an Ang there was a famous Anglican theologian over a hundred years ago, and he was at Dean Inge, and he was asked, what did he think about liturgy? And he said, well, some people are interested in liturgy and some people collect stamps. <laughs> and in other words, it's just, it really is just a fad. Whereas the common good, that belongs to something far more important. It's the interface between the gospel and the world. And it's something that demands action. And it's something that isn't belonging to the airy fairy world of theory and theologians. It's an ethical getting out there and doing something. So rather than give, I don't intend, I noticed I wasn't, when I looked at the, the, the poster that Rab sent me a few months ago. I noticed he didn't say lecture by, he said companion for the evening is Tom O'Loughlin. So I'm going to, I'm going to do something very, very simple. And I'm just going to ask you to think about four questions on liturgy. And then in the light of, of the, the answers to those questions, to think about four simple expressions that, that may be useful on a Lenten journey. The first question is, is liturgy private or public? Now, obviously, one could go and just say, well, the Greek means light or gia, and that means public work. But Christian liturgy, for most Christians, is still something very private. It's me and my relationship with God. And so I say my prayers, 
and my prayers have some sort of urgency that our prayers do not have. We tend to think going to Mass, getting Mass, I attend church. It's almost as if I'm going there for my private religious fix to support me for the day or for the week. And the idea that we actually do it together, and this is an expression of who we are, is something we're only coming to terms with very slowly, despite the fact that we've had a public liturgy that we can all share in because it's in the vernacular and was designed to be shared in by everyone, not just a handful of specialists, for the last 60 years. So our instinct is to say liturgy is just lots of individuals all praying in the same place at the same time because they need to collect something that's best served in a collective delivery unit. And so we find bishops worrying, but is there someone to say mass for them? Rather than asking, how do I help that community celebrate the Eucharist? But if we think of liturgy as public, then it makes new demands on us because it becomes part, not just of my action, but our action as a community, and it becomes part of our witness. And new problems arise. Learning to pray is something that is very difficult. Oh, it's easy to learn off prayers, but to actually switch off and to let our thoughts and our words and our mind and our body seek to come into some sort of contact with the unseen mystery of God is a lifetime's work. But equally, Learning to pray as a group takes time. I remember chatting to a, an old monk and he said, there is nothing harder for a monastic community than learning to pray together. And yet we all are expected to just turn up on church on Sunday morning and be able to pray as a group together. And it doesn't help that often we don't know the person next to us. We've never spoken to the people who were in front or behind us. And the whole event is rather uncomfortable. Imagine we decided that a group were going to meet, instead of going to this talk down the pub, the first thing we do is we take off our coats take off our caps, comment on the fact that the weather outside is cold and miserable, at least it is where I am. And then we'd make ourselves comfortable and introduce one another. And then we would gradually, very gradually, learn how to talk together. Compare that with arriving in a church on a bitterly cold winter Sunday morning. And you Muffle, you're muffled up, you're actually there for attending something the equivalent of that's taking place in a field. So one of the things where we actually are very poor at as yet as Catholics is to realize that liturgy is not just individuals in a group, but a community made up of individuals where we have to be Yes, each of us true to ourselves, but aware we are also a new unity, this community, and that as a community, we are going to pray 
and bear witness and act. Second question, does liturgy belong to the world of the sacred or the profane? Is it secular or is it religious? Our culture and indeed a vast tradition within, I won't call it Christian thinking, but within religious thinking is firmly convinced that the distinction between the sacred and the profane is an absolute one. Indeed, the great German phenomenologist of religion, Rudolf Otto, over a hundred years ago, defined religion as everything that didn't belong to the ordinary world. It was the uncanny. It was the, it was the odd. There was the world of getting on, measuring things, earning your keep. And then there's this other world. And this other world was where religion belonged. And that's where liturgy belongs. And deep within us, we have this idea that there's a danger that somehow liturgy would be profaned and that liturgy would lose its sacredness and lose its mystery. That's the basic argument of the Latin Mass Society. So we don't mind the fact that often it's an exercise in antiquarianism. Uh, why must the priest be dressed up like a Roman, like a Roman upper middle class gentleman from the fourth century? The question we have as Christians is, is liturgy to be defined within that binary of the sacred and the profane? Or is God the Lord of the whole earth, of the whole cosmos? And if he's Lord of all, then liturgy doesn't form something separate, but forms something that is part of life, but it's focused on origin and end. It's not that it is taken out and made separate to the rest of life, but is extended in its range and in its intensity to the rest of life. Waiting on the at the bus stop, I may only be concerned with getting from A to B but it's in the same world in which I take part in liturgy, except I'm more concerned with alpha and omega. So we tend to think of the world, or indeed reality, and then there is this special world apart, this equivalent of stamp collecting, called liturgy. But the moment we separate liturgy from the world, even for the best of intentions, and there have been popes that have gone down this road, the idea that you make the liturgy as, un, as, as unordinary as possible, then we're actually relegating God to the margins of life. My third question is, is, does liturgy, is liturgy something that, that is really belonging to the, the insiders, whether it's the Catholics or the Christians or the monotheists? Is it our private doing, or is it actually, no matter what sort of a community we are, is it something we're doing on behalf of all humanity?
because we are now a minority in most, most societies, there's a danger that Christians can retreat into themselves and think that liturgy is just us doing our thing. We don't have to worry about anyone else. I was looking just a few days ago at a letter in the tablet a couple of weeks ago from the Latin Mass Society. And it was quite frightening in the narrowness of its vision. This was the way I like to pray and others like me. And, you know, we really should be allowed to do whatever we want to do because this is the way we like doing it. And of course, we're doing it because it's uncontaminated and it's full of mystery. Well, no, that's a selfish view of liturgy as one can have. That means it's a little bit like saying, this is the type of music I like. So if you don't like jazz, don't come to the jazz club. If you want the symphony, go to the concert hall. But it's not an aesthetic experience. And it's certainly not a private experience, but it's something where we as a community are bearing witness before the whole of the universe that there is a mystery beyond all that we see and beneath all that we see, and that our concerns are not just my concerns, but their concerns that are coming to the surface in our words and in our thoughts, but they are concerns for the whole of humanity. So for instance, when we are concerned about climate change, we're not concerned about that in a selfish way. Oh Lord, save all Catholics from the effects of climate change. But we're actually doing this as part of our consciousness for the whole of humanity. So it's not an insider event, but something we do on behalf of all. And that's one of the reasons why intrinsically it has to be open and comprehensible. Oh, it may be lovely to have a sense of the misty and the uncanny. But that's a human sense. It's been written about by people like Edmund Burke when he talked about the sublime. Apologies. It's been written about by Edmund Burke when he talked about the sublime. It's been written about by philosophers who talk about the, the, the weird and the uncanny. What we're actually saying is, God is ever present and God is also infinitely greater. But our starting point is in the reality of the universe around us. And we speak to the whole universe. And so we speak as clearly as we possibly can. And lastly, is religion a matter of the specialist or of the whole community? When we hear it's the word of the whole community, until very recently, the alarm bells rang. Oh, that's Presbyterianism. That's congregationalism. But one of the great changes in the liturgy between before Vatican II and after Vatican II, far greater than the shift from Latin to English, and indeed far more profound than the textual changes that reformed the liturgy was the change that it is not a matter of a single specialist offering liturgy on behalf of, but the priestly work of the whole people of God. 
Liturgy flows not from ordination, but from baptism. And that changes everyone's role, the role of the one who presides, who's trying to lead and give guidance to the liturgy, and the dignity of the activity of everyone who was there. Again, there is something within our culture, and it's larger than Christianity, that thinks that liturgy is the work of the priest or the vicar or the rabbi or whatever he's called. Let's leave it to him. I'm sure you've all seen the old pub sign of the soldier saying, I fight for all. Then there's a picture of the vicar, I pray for all. And the, and the judge, I judge all. And the king, I rule all. But, but that essentially is an image of liturgy that's derived from pagan Roman religion, where the various priesthoods were those who were paid by the state to carry out something on behalf of the state. But within Judaism, everyone was a member of the covenant. And within Jesus's vision of the community of the new covenant, everyone has the dignity of being part of a priestly people. So liturgy is not a private affair, but a public activity. It's something that must not be put into a little box called sacred versus secular but must somehow embrace the whole of our human concerns. It's not an insider thing, it's not our private thing, but something that each community, when it worships, does on behalf of all mankind. And it is an affair that affects, that flows from our dignity as baptism, and not something that we can outsource to a specialist or a little specialist group. Now let's take those and see how they can manifest themselves in particular actions. I'm always struck that at the center of the Eucharist is thanking God for his gifts and sharing. And it's sharing food. And Paul is terrified by the fact that he knows that in the community in Corinth, they're no longer sharing food. They're no longer sharing with the poor. The stratification of society is now, strat is now a stratified meal with the wealthy racing ahead and having wondrous food and the poor having whatever they can, they can scrape together. But the vision of Christian liturgy is that since we are all equal in baptism, and it is a community event, then we are all equal in the sharing. So it's not a case that there's liturgy and there's the work for the food bank, or there's liturgy and then there is something that is given over to the food bank. But can one have authentic liturgy and regrettably in our society, which needs food banks, not also be sharing food with the poor. The authenticity of the Eucharist is proven in the reality of helping the common good in running a food bank. And the larger vision that empowers the food bank is that we are all children of God 
and need to be thankful to God for all we have. Liturgy informs the food bank and the food bank becomes an expression of the reality of our liturgy. If we have one without the other, we have fallen into the trap of the sacred and the secular, the sacred and the profane. This one universe, God made Sunday, but we'll make the rest of it. And then a second thing is, liturgy must somehow help people make sense of their lives. And not only must it help them to make sense, but it must support them in their lives. But what about someone who is marginalized in society? What about the divorced and the remarried? What about gay and lesbian couples? Are they excluded? Are they not two children of God? Have they too not a, a need to worship God and to thank God? Are we going to exclude those from our community? Well, if we are, we're sending out a signal that liturgy is not really belonging to the whole of humanity, but only to those who meet a certain set of criteria. The danger is whenever we do anything as a group, we're sending out signals. And when we send out signals, those signals have to be compatible with the gospel of the God who is reconciling the world to himself in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, well, they can come, but they can't eat. They can come, but they can't share. So we will use the most mean and narrow of human experience to mirror the expectations we have of the divine welcome and the divine welcome that we are supposed to somehow model to humanity. And liturgy must somehow model the universe that is preached in the gospel. I'm going to take a very practical example. On this day week, there will be the Mass of the Lord's Supper. And in the middle of it, there will be a washing of the feet. And we will seek to put into liturgical effect the text we have just read at that liturgy from John chapter 13. And the parish priest will, with great performance, get up, remove his chasuble, and then there'll be 12. Until recently, people argued there could only be 12 men. It actually took a papal letter to say, no, there are actually women in the church too. And he may get down and wash the feet of 12 people. And we then say, isn't he so humble? I, your Lord and master, am going to wash your feet. And so the message we take out of that ceremony is, isn't father great? Look at the way he does that. He's here as the servant of all. Well, of course, father is there as a servant. Well, that's why he's a minister, servant. But read the gospel a little bit more carefully. I have set you a paradigm is the word.
that each of you should wash each other's feet. It's not a case of a priest demonstrating humility, but all of us demonstrating to one another that we are to one another within the church, both servants and recipients of service. I did a little number count a few years ago of parishes. How many parishes even mentioned the washing of the feet? How many had some surrogate like bringing a bowl of water and a jug up? And how many actually did it? And how many included more than 12 boys or 12 men? It was quite a terrifying thing because I found that here was a piece of liturgy that is very hard to do precisely because it involves a community, precisely because it involves the idea of service and it's awkward. The figures were not encouraging of us thinking of the liturgy as of us all involved and all serving one another. And lastly, it's very easy to have a liturgy that is so perfect, so wonderful, that it is almost like a museum performance of some of the texts we have from the early centuries of the church. Liturgy can become an idol, but actually liturgy happens where it happens and it's always messy, precisely because humanity is messy. Liturgy is part of our onward journey. It has loose edges because the pilgrim people of God have frayed edges. And if you think you're not one of the ones who has a frayed edge, then think again. A few months ago, I was at a Eucharist and a priest reminded us all just before it was, it was, it was at Christmas time, so there were a larger community than usual. And he reminded us all that non-Catholics could come up and get a blessing. People in a state of sin could come up and get a blessing. And then if you hadn't been to confession and you had a mortal sin, you could come up and get a blessing. And he gave instructions on how you were to signal this. And then he said, but you must not retake part by receiving the sacred species. I watched how many people could go up. First of all, less than half the community moved. And of those that moved, less than half were there to eat and drink. I actually thought to myself, I am so annoyed at this that I can't actually feel I'm sharing with this man in the loaf and the cup of the Lord. So I didn't leave my seat either. But it's quite frightening. The liturgy had become an idol. But the common good assumes that it's all of us together. It takes place in the midst of life, in all its hurts and harms. We do it on behalf of the whole of humanity. And therefore, we assume 
that we're somehow trying to preach the gospel that is full of mercy and love. And each of us are there with the same rights as everyone else, because we are all the baptized. And we're conscious that any signal we send out there will not be seen as our defective poor signal, but it will be attributed to the church or even worse to Christianity or even worse to religion or to the God botherers. We have an obligation to mirror the gospel as a community of faith moving forward, sharing in our baptism and wishing goodness and love to all humanity. Thank you. And I think I've gone way over my 30 minutes. Sorry. Tom, thank you very much. Um, where to begin? Where to begin? There is so much to unpick, so much to ponder. And I'm sure that this is one of those conversations we could spend all night uh, and, and far longer just unpicking and, and sharing it. But I'll give everyone a moment. Please do share your questions, thoughts, reflections in the chat to, to start our conversation. But one of the things, Tom, that, that struck me from perhaps the earlier part of your contribution tonight was the importance of getting to know the community around us and truly becoming a community in order to share in the liturgy. And I wonder if you could speak a bit more to kind of practical steps towards that. Well, we, we say that liturgy is at the heart of life. It is the center and summit of the Christian life. When we gather, we talk to one another as sisters and brothers. Uh, we talk about being friends. Uh, I, I do not call you servants anymore. I call you friends. So we gather as friends. So we have an enormous rhetoric uh, of the intimacy and closeness of forming a community that is supportive and a community that is open and welcoming. But I was struck by, you know, the words from the Pope at the beginning there, you know, we're to speak with Heresia, we're to speak with, with openness and frankness. But that's not what people expect. So a bit of frank, that's not what people experience. Uh, so you act, you know, to be squeezed into a into a into a hard pew, and you when you try to stand up, your feet get stuck underneath the kneeler, and you're sort of when you stand, you're not standing properly, you're sort of foot in and knees out, knees bent, and that then when you sit down, it's anything but comfortable. And you go in with you go in and wear your coat. Think about things you get. If you're getting on a bus, you keep and you you just you get a you you keep your coat on because you're not actually getting involved in anything. Uh, we we actually we actually uh, we talk about community and the common good, but it's not an experience that we actually get. When we when we gather for liturgy, um, like the first thing you do is you if you if you have a a group is you get people to introduce them to themselves to one another. If someone is new, oh oh yeah, let's introduce one another. Um, there's a there's a there's a terrifying reality at the moment that. And I'm afraid 
when you say this to bishops, they don't know what you're talking about. They, they think you can keep enlarging communities. What do you give the parish priest to is everything, another parish. And it's assumed that you can just make it a larger group. And the group keeps getting larger and larger. Well, that's just nonsense. Because you can't relate within such a large group. You can relate in, a, in, a, in human sized groups where we can actually relate are much smaller. And that's something that has been the Christian experience down the years, that it's a group who have an identity and then they can welcome a new person into the, into the group. It's not just a collection of individuals. So if liturgy is about community, you actually have to have some real experience of community. So let me ask you, Tom, and then I'll put this to you and then we'll move to the chat, um, because I, I'm really intrigued by this notion of, of how we break down those barriers when, for example, someone new comes into the community and how we get to know the other. But if I could give you an example of um, a parish that I know where, without naming names or anything of the like, a, a priest uh, tried to introduce something around, you know, say hello, shake hands with the person next to you when you arrive. And so often I was intrigued by the number of people I spoke to who were so uncomfortable with this because it was so new, it was so different. How do we, I think a lot of the questions in the chat are already reflecting this. How do we move forward into that way of thinking when we have been so used to not doing I, it? I think the fact is that for, I think we have, I think we have not, after 60 years, it's 60 years since, since Vatican II, 61 years since the opening of the Second Vatican Council, and it will be 60 years in December since the promulgation of the Liturgy Constitution. But we still, we still, we still have a rhetoric that we're a collection of individuals. We have not, we've, we've hardly addressed that. And that presider that tried to get people to shake hands, he's moving in the right direction, but it's a very slow process. And we should also be aware that we live in a consumerist society, we live in an individualist society, and consumerism is about what I get. And often there's a subtext in our liturgies that, that, that goes very well with a consumerist. But one of the, one of the messages our literature should be sent out, life is not, should not be lived in a consumerist way. And individualism can be a very dangerous thing. So we have, the first step is to be even aware that we've got a problem. And how you actually manage it depends on your gifts and the community you are actually with. So I'm going to turn to the chat now. And I'm going to pick up the first question which came in, which says, how do we move towards authentic liturgical communities within the current church framework of liturgy being priest-centered? So just taking us forward a bit from where we've been discussing. Uh, well, liturgy takes place whenever a group of Christians gather to worship. And often we expect everything to happen in the Eucharist, where within our theology, you have to have an ordained presbyter. But what other expressions of liturgy are there? How, 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 in what other ways can smaller real communities come together and offer praise and thanksgiving to God? So, I'm hesitant to sit here to a group of people 
whom I hardly, I know many of your names. I've seen many of you on Zoom, but I'm not gonna say, here's a, you know, here's quick fire answers to thinking out how you actually build community. Because I know how I have to struggle to build community and I do it precisely because it's part of living the gospel. And rather than I just say, do this, do that, do the other, it's something that real groups of people have to get together and say, well, how do we address it? Not, we might take an idea from what they're doing five miles down the road or what someone has read, but it's actually something that has to arise there and then from an actual group of people. I know that sounds like a cop out, but I'm not doing it to cop out. I'm doing it because there's no, there's no set of, there's no magic bullet. There is, there are structural problems within the Catholic Church. The idea that we have a specialist priesthood, highly specialized group, a super uh, group identity. You know, but this is the whole question of clericalism. And we're trying to address that. It's one of the issues that are going, it's going to come up in the Synod. But I'm equally aware that there are people saying, I don't see the problem. I don't see the problem. Uh, I was talking to a priest whom I know for 40 years, a couple of days ago, and he just doesn't see the problem. So the, we do we we Catholics have uh, have a, have have deep structural problems. We have to be aware of them. And we have to be ready to use this frankness and say, look, what are you going to do about this? So if we could take that forward, maybe just a, a little bit more, and if I could draw on the, the presidential role, the question that we have is how do we begin to develop that specific role so that the ministries of all of the baptised, the, the common priesthood, can be empowered to feel more engaged and to be more engaged? Uh, just over two years ago, um, the Pope issued what could be one of the most important documents since Vatican II, where he said that every Christian, man and woman, can now be instituted as a lector. And lots of people said, oh, well, that says, so what's the difference between someone reading on a Sunday morning and someone being instituted as a lector? Well, reading can easily be seen as just doing a job. Uh, how often have we seen is there a reader? Is there a reader today? Is there a reader? No, there isn't. And Father just runs over and does the reading. But the fact that there's a lecture is that our liturgy is not just the priest's responsibility, it's the responsibility of all of us to use our skills. And it's actually a skill to take a text, often a very difficult text, and to publicly proclaim it so that it actually makes sense as you read it and as you hear it. Well, in how many dioceses have we been instituting lectors? How many have we been instituting acolytes to assist in the sharing of the Eucharistic elements? 
And then a few, more, a few weeks later, the Pope instituted a new formal ministry of catechist. I know lots of people who've taught catechism, but how many people have been instituted as catechists? In other words, are we actually structurally taking on the problems of clericalism? Alas, these are, these are just tiny steps. They're baby steps, but we're not yet taking them. So I know I'm carrying coals to Newcastle in speaking to you, or at least I hope I am, because I'm aware that nothing I've said is in any way new. That's, that's, that's just the nature of bringing a reflection in Lent. But we don't, we don't, we, we, I hear people worrying about vast steps. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that we're taking so few, even tiny steps. So then if I could turn now specifically to the point of communion, I'm going to take two questions together, but if that's okay, Tom, the first one asks for um, a bit of clarification around the, the um, example you gave us from the funeral um, around you know, those who were excluded from coming forward to receive communion um, and asks for a bit of clarification around um, whether you feel everyone should have been able to receive, everyone should have been able to share. Uh, and the, the second question in relation to that um, asks, how is it possible that people are still excluded, in particular where children are able to receive communion, but their divorced and remarried parents are not? There's a, there's a day, there is a very, there's a very long tradition within Christianity that we look on the Eucharist as a prize and we divorce the Eucharist in such a way from life that it becomes only there for those who are already saints. And this came to an extreme form in Catholicism 350 years ago with the Jansenists who were a man, fam a famous theologian wrote a book called On Frequent Communion, but actually the whole purpose of the book was to show how infrequent. Once you start seeing the Eucharist as some sort of prize for the holy, then if you actually take it to its logical conclusion, no one is really worthy. And that's what actually happened. But one of the things that happened at Vatican II was that we realized that it's food for our pilgrim journey. As Aquinas said, we come as sick to the physician. And Pope Francis talks about the church being the field hospital that binds up and feeds the wounded. Every one of us has both wounded and is wounded. And if we start looking for who is worthy, then we will all exclude one another. It's far better to start and say, who are we as a people and what are our needs? Well, we're a people who rejoice because God loves us and has sent us the Christ. And the way we rejoice is we join in the supper of that Christ. 
And if you join to the supper, you eat and you drink. And the Lord feeds us in his supper because as ordinary food and drink support us in the joys, sufferings, trials, and sheer energy we need for the coming hours. So sharing in the Lord's Supper supports us on our pilgrim journey. It's not a question of, can I eat? That's, that's almost like, have I, have I enough spiritual cash in my wallet that merits me a place? It's, will I eat? Are you prepared to eat this? If you're prepared to eat this, then you're making a commitment that's far larger than just saying amen. You're making a commitment to being a disciple and to living like a disciple. Are you prepared to have a place at table? And can you drink the cup of which I must drink? Yes, Lord, we are able. Well, you will drink that cup. But as for a place at table, that is only granted by the Father. We're willing, it's not a case of can I eat, but are you willing to eat? And if we're there, we are making a statement that we're willing to eat. And certainly, no one speaking in the name of the church is, can act as the heavenly gatekeeper. Because that role belongs to the Father. Now, in, in so much of what we've discussed tonight, there is that, that strong message of what Pope Francis talks about as the danger of clericalism. And uh, one of our, our questions comes from someone who says that in, in their experience, they've had very little experience of it and they realise they're fortunate as a result. But from engaging in online forums, they, they see the kind of damage that clericalism can do. Where do we start to change this, Tom? Well, it's always easier to start to change oneself than to try and change someone else. And uh, one of the one of the ways is we realize our own dignity as the baptized. Um, um, when a community uh, ha, when, in, when the individuals in a community have a sense of their own dignity and that each person is called to minister, but everyone has different ministries, then in a sense, the power structure of clericalism, um, of the leader and the led, the officers and the other ranks, the teaching church and the listening church, the ordering church and the obeying church, that model is broken down. Um, I'm often struck by 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 the, the 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 gestures and the language that people use. Um, there's a language of welcome, which is a Christian language, and there's a language of deference, which actually belongs to the marketplace. And yet, often we confuse the two. Uh, we're often struck, people often talk about the holy or the sacred, but actually what they mean is the solemn. And what they mean, they talk about the, the they use phrases like the, there was a, the, 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 the spiritual 
dimension, but what they actually mean is powerfulness. And the, 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 we're all infest, infected by these things. Um, this sense of awe before power and might. Um, for instance, I, I often wonder, you know, call no one father, and yet uh, clergy, clergy insist on titles, reverend, very reverend, right reverend, most reverend. Um, I was asked recently um, by someone who, who was inviting a, inviting a, one of the head chaplains of the senior chaplains of the forces. In which order did the titles come? The church titles or the military titles? And I said, I didn't know, but I would look it up. And I looked up an old book on clerical etiquette. And the answer is the reverend title comes before everything. So it was the reverend, the colonel, X canon Y. And then his clerical initials came before his military initials. And I just thought, how very interesting. Even before he fitted into a, a military hierarchy, the military by their very nature have to have hierarchies. He fitted into a clerical hierarchy where we're all supposed to be servants of one another. But we all, we, so I don't know. I think we invite each person to say, are you prepared to wash the feet of the person next to them? And are you prepared to have your feet washed by the person next? That's a, that is a question which belongs to Maundy Thursday, the commandment, love one another. But it's also a question which undermines clericalism. If I can pop back to our earlier discussion, just to, to bring in another question in relation to it. So following on from our discussion around communion and who is excluded from communion, the questioner asks, where does that leave us in relation to confession? Hey, the need for reconciliation is a fundamental need in the Christian life. That's fundamental. But it doesn't help tying you. We use the word communion. You're using the word communion. I didn't use it. And the reason I didn't use it is that it belongs to a world where there was mass and communion and where Communion was almost separable from mass. And communion is something you receive. But think about it, communion is a reality. We belong in communion. We share in the Eucharist because it's the very nature of the Eucharistic meal that we share. That's the very nature of meals together, we share meals. Now, once we start thinking of the need for reconciliation as somehow a, a, an entry ticket to sharing in the Eucharist, we're making it all into a single process. And Catholics do it with the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And we've been doing that since the seventh century. And we institutionalized it in the 13th century, at the beginning of the 13th century, when we instituted Easter duty. 
And we forget that Easter duty was instituted. So the people would go at least once a year to communion because people were not going even once a year. And then we said, well, you've then, so I don't know whether you saw the Antiques Road show a couple of weeks ago, but there was a We Free, there was someone from one of the We Frees and they had the bag of tokens that were given out by the minister, which entitled you to receive communion when they celebrated communion once a year at Easter time in a We Free parish. Well, in each case, we're, 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 we're turning it into a process. I'd hate to have told that Presbyterian minister that he had actually fallen into the, the worst form of Pelagianism. And I'm sure it would have, I'm sure he would have said, well, you're one to talk, you Catholic Pelagian, but never mind. I hope that, just as I hope the We Freeze have given up the idea that you have to have a token that shows you merit getting into the communion line. I hope we Catholics have given up this idea that reconciliation is almost like a, a you know, a, 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 it's a quick dust down, which enables us to be ready to get something. Reconciliation is ongoing. We need to be praying for reconciliation day in, day out. We need to gather with the Christ to praise the Father. And that gathering is sharing his meal. These are two ongoing realities of a pilgrim people. Don't tie them together as if only if you've petrol in the car can you start the engine. Or only if you have the right mask or gloves on can you enter the building. That's, that's mechanizing the onward mystery of our discipleship. I'm conscious of time, but I'd really like to take a, a couple of final questions. So first of all, I'm going to take these two together because I want to come to, to a final question after this. So first of all, speaking about this, this notion of moving forward and, uh, and how we all accept the kind of responsibility within the common priesthood for liturgy, is there an answer that lies within the domestic church and is, is there an answer which lies within the development of a domestic liturgy? Does this whole conversation lead us to a more careful approach to catechesis and RCIA, for example? So two points there, one around the domestic church and one around the, the opportunity for catechesis in a wider sense, such as in RCIA. Hey, we're living in the first society in human history, uh, and it only applies, it doesn't apply around the world, um, but it certainly applies in our culture and in North American culture and in the culture on the mainland in Europe, uh, where religion for the first time is an option. We no longer take it for granted that everyone treats religious observance as a should do. And that changes the whole dynamism of how all of the churches, and indeed how the three great monotheisms uh, have to structure not only the way they present themselves, but the way they hand on the faith to the next generation, and then the way they envisage that faith. 
And that means we cannot assume that everyone will see going to church is some sort of a, a norm. It's not a norm. It's a choice to join with other believers and there to worship together. And that means it will always be a, for the foreseeable future, decades, probably centuries, we're going to have to see each person who becomes a fellow disciple as having gone down a path of encountering the Christ and encountering the church and then making a conscious decision to move along our way with us. That will mean that our CIA will move from being something that we, we, we play at it in many of our parishes in Britain it will become something that will be the norm. Uh, we will see things like the alpha course, whether it'll be the alpha course or the beta course or the gamma course, I don't know what it will be called. I don't know what structure it'll take, but we will see that as the normal way that people will discover Christianity. Oh yes, there'll be still people for decades to come that will come from the Philippines, who work in the health service, and they will have had the experience of entering the faith more or less the way I did. I grew up with it. Um, it was just what everyone did. But that's going to change Christianity more drastically than anything, because we're not going to be the religious side of society. We're going to be a minority interest and where everything we do will be seen as not just the church doing its thing, but it will be us witnessing to the gospel. And that will put new stresses and strains on all of us. And as regards the domestic question, One only encounters living faith when one encounters people of living faith. And that will not have the great public expressions that it could have had when everyone shared the same, the same, uh, not only the same religion, but the same calendar, the same everything else. And that would mean it would be discovered at a much smaller domestic scale. So the question of catechesis and the domestic scale are not two separate questions. They're the same question in the society in which we live. Uh, we're coming up to Easter. For us, it's the center of the year. A hundred years ago, everyone would have known Easter. We even expected the banks to close on Good Friday. We still have remnants of that. But how many people, if we were to go around the society, could even tell us what that means? And how many of those would it make any sense other than they might know, they might know a little bit about Ramadan from watching the little bit that was given out on the on the on the six o'clock news a couple of days ago. I was listening to Sophie Rayworth on, on news at six giving a 20 second introduction to what is Ramadan. And I thought, well, they at least got an expert on Islam to write that 20 seconds for the BBC. 
Well, we probably need 20 seconds also on what is Easter Sunday. We certainly need 20 seconds on what is Good Friday. Uh, so that means the catechesis and domesticity are effectively the same reality where religion is no longer an obligatory part of society. We are opting in. One final question, and I have run over time, but I want to put this final question to you, Tom. Came in to me separately, and it simply says, can I ask you if you feel like you're a lone voice crying in the wilderness? Uh, oh no, no, I'm not, uh, because I, I, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, I know, I know hundreds of people. Um, no, I'm, I'm not, because um, I just look, I just look, I just. I, ha I haven't got the I haven't got the screen set up with all your faces on it, um, but I look at all. I'm I'm sure that that, that um, I wish. Oh, thank you. It's now suddenly gone different, and I see you all your faces. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm 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 very conscious that 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 that. that Renewal is a reality continuously in the Christian church. Um, no, it's, it's, but it's, it's also difficult. Uh, Catholicism finds renewal more difficult than many other churches because we've had a, we, one of the mistakes that we made in the aftermath of the Council of Trent was we thought that system uh, the rigid systems would be would be the best way of making sure that never again there would be a rebellion which the word they used like that which happened in the 16th century and that meant that we are not very nimble on our feet but i see i see renewal taking place all over the church and uh, like that's presumably why you asked me to speak to you tonight. Indeed. Thank you very much, Tom. I, I did. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to come in on that one. So thank you very much for sharing with us and uh, for, for doing so, so openly, for giving us so much to, to consider. I'm now going to hand back over to Mary. Thanks, Callum. Um, it's my great privilege um, to thank you, Tom, for sharing your wisdom and your scholarship, your deep scholarship so lightly and kind of gently peeling away some of our, I don't know how to describe them, things we've forgotten or things that are not in focus for us as they perhaps should be. It was a wonderful talk and beautifully delivered. And I think we will all go away much the richer for it and take lots of what you have said into you know the, the coming days and towards towards Easter. Um, so thank you very much. It was a very rich experience to listen to you. Um, and you have a wonderful, gently, gentle way of of helping people perhaps to see things that we've a wee bit lost sight of sometimes. So thank you. Um, I think now what we do is we would like to say a prayer for you. And I think this is Rosa will do this. Loving God, we thank you for the scholarship, insight and praise of Tom. We thank you for what he has shared with us tonight. We ask that you anoint him anew such that his life and his ministry may continue to be empowered by your spirit. Amen. We also pray, pray for open house. Loving God, God, we thank you for the gift of open house. We thank you for it continuing to be rooted in the vision and hope of Vatican II and its commitment to the dialogue 
which began at the Council with other churches, other faiths and the secular world. Amen. And we conclude our evening by praying for ourselves as we continue to go forth on our Lenten journey. During this liturgical season, may we seek to ascend that high mountain in the company of Jesus. May we truly listen to him in scripture and in the faces and stories of our sisters and brothers, especially those who are in need. May the spirit inspire us to rise and not be afraid as we face reality and its daily struggles, its hardships and contradictions. Amen. The aim of the Scottish Theatre Network is to seek to help us reflect on the signs of the times and discern how we are called to be disciples and followers of Jesus. The plight of refugees and migrants and the UK government's illegal immigration bill has prompted us to offer a time of prayer and reflection on Good Friday which seems a pertinent night to do this. We are delighted to welcome back our friend and companion, Alison Phipps, who will facilitate our session. Please join us if you can. We know it's Good Friday and people have many other commitments, but I think we feel this is such an urgent situation that is facing the most poor and vulnerable in our world and being inflicted upon by our government. Please join us. To those who are leaving the meeting at this point, good night, God bless and we invite you to log off. For those who wish to stay and join a breakout room, please stay connected and we will generate the breakout rooms. Thank you. <laughs>